This episode, I'm joined by Murray Stein, who is a training analyst at the International School for Analytical Psychology in Switzerland, alongside publishing various books on the work of Carl Jung, and Paul Bishop, who is the author of multiple books on the work of Carl Jung, alongside other books on analytical psychology. In this first episode on Carl Jung's Black Books, we discuss the genesis of the Black Books, their history, and their relation to Jung's famous Red Book. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support the podcast and keep it going indefinitely, please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. Uh, I am joined by Murray Stein and Paul Bishop uh, to for this, this first episode, this first session on Carl Jung's Black Books or The Black Books, uh, which were, um, well, or are or were a collection of seven private journals which Carl Jung uh, principally wrote between 1913 and 1932, uh, even though they referred as The Black Books. Um, two of them are actually brown, just a little bit of detail there. Uh, and they have only become uh, publicly accessible, so to speak, um, because of the publication by W.W. W. Norton and Company in October last year, 2020. So this is the first time uh, that the the public can get their hands on the Black Books, which are uh, we'll, we'll go into what they are specifically and how they came about. But very, very roughly, they are the books which led to Carl Jung's infamous The Red Book, uh, Liber Novus. Um, but before we jump in with these things, um, as I discussed earlier, we are joined by Paul Bishop, who many of you will have uh, who know and have um, heard before on our uh, episodes on the work of Ludwig Klagers and also on Carl Jung's The Red Book. Um, but we're also joined by Murray Stein. So, Murray, t- tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm a Jungian analyst and have been for about 40 years now. I graduated from the C.G. Jung Institute when it was located still in Zurich in 1973. I moved back to the United States and worked as a Jungian analyst primarily in Chicago until 2003 when I relocated uh, to my great uh, surprise and delight back to Switzerland, uh, which is the place I love to live in and uh, the country I find most, I guess, compatible with my temperament and uh, my typology. Um, um, I work uh, as a, a training analyst and supervising analyst at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, ISEP, it's called. Um, it's an international school. Uh, repre- uh, about 20 countries are represented in the student body from uh, pretty much all over the world. And I enjoy very much working with the students uh, who uh, bring many different cultural perspectives and uh, backgrounds uh, into our seminars and conversation so it's a um it's a wonderful life i i enjoy uh, my life in switzerland i spend a lot of time online now since the lockdown uh, began over a year ago and um, do my analytic work online practice as an analyst do my teaching i give quite a few lectures online to people all over the world including uh, china and russia and ukraine and many places. So um, I, I'm, I'm very thankful for this technology that we're using today uh, to be able to broadcast the uh, information and the um, appreciation that we have for Jung and his work and, um, and to, to make it um, better known to um, our contemporaries. I also had the surprising, um, I guess, an honor that uh, a famous pop band, a pop group, a uh, K-pop group called BTS, uh, selected my book, Jung's Map of the Soul, to um, create a couple of their albums, which became worldwide bestsellers. And so in their songs and in their performances, they're actually teaching Jungian psychology. They teach about the persona, about the ego, the shadow. Uh, and so... Uh, I've been in contact with their fans called the Army um, uh, quite a lot since uh, this began over a year ago, and I've done quite a few broadcasts with uh, BTS people, uh, including recently Indonesia of all places. Um, So that's been a great joy and pleasure for me to see that Jung's ideas are 
getting some traction uh, in the new generation. And uh, and I think with with uh, quite uh, um, authentic um, uh, um, messages being um, sent out by this BTS group, I've been very impressed with their songs, the lyrics, and their uh, of course their performances are outstanding, brilliant, but uh, also the content of the lyrics uh, are very suggestive and people do pay attention to them and ask me serious questions about the meaning of um, these these ideas. So uh, that's been one of the latest features of my activity in, as a Jungian analyst recently. Okay, okay. Perhaps um, K-pop as a vessel to spread the Jungian message will we'll come back in later. But as Paul um, reminded me, uh, you, it's your first time on the podcast, so I didn't put this question uh, in the question. So I apologize for giving you this on the, uh, you know, as a sort of spontaneous surprise. But the Hermetics question is: You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room uh, and listen in on the conversation. Uh, who would you pick? And and as we're talking about Carl Jung, we could include Carl Jung. So this is the the question for newcomers to the podcast: uh, Is Jung one of the three? So uh, would- Jung is already there, and then three more. And we bring uh, three more. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, I certainly would bring Harold Bloom. He was my teacher at Yale. Um, and um, to this day, I read him uh, 50 years later. He died a couple of years ago. Um, he was a brilliant um, literary critic and, uh, and a, um, a, a, he called himself a, uh, Bardolator, he worshipped Shakespeare. Although when I studied with him, it was the Romantic poets. Um, so I bring him into the room, and he had a very um, uneasy uh, relationship to Jung. I think basically at heart he was a Jungian, but because he was Jewish and because of his um, feelings about what happened to the Jews in Europe uh, during the Holocaust and Jung's positioning himself as he did during that time, he couldn't quite bring himself to be, uh, to call himself a Jungian, but I would like to see him in discussion with Jung, and I think that would be a fantastic conversation. And then I would like to bring a theologian in, um, and um, and that would be either Paul Tillich or Karl Barth. Paul Tillich was a Jung fan. Karl Barth dismissed Jung. So I probably bring in Karl Barth uh, just to get some sparks going. Uh, Karl Barth didn't think very much of Jung's writing on the Bible in answer to Job. Paul can say quite a bit about that, I'm sure. Um, and he said it was a fantasy of a psychologist, uh, not a serious theological work. But I think in dialogue, they could be quite interesting. And Bloom, who was a Gnostic, certainly would chime in on that conversation. Um, and then... Who else would I bring in? Um, I want to bring in a woman. Um, I think I might bring in um, I would like to hear from Emma Young. Uh, she wasn't a brilliant intellectual, but she knew Young's heart and soul probably better than anybody else did. And um, I think she could participate and hold her own in a conversation. She was quite an admirer of Martin Buber, who who Jung didn't care much for. Um, But I think she could hold her own in her conversations with Jung on the issue of dialogue and um, community uh, values and so on that Buber stood for and Jung was rather dismissive of. Um, so I guess I'd like to see a conversation going about the individual and community. How do individuals relate to communities? How do communities relate to individuals? Uh, is it possible for individuals to withstand the pressure of uh, collectives, uh, remain themselves, and is it possible for them to participate fully in communities without losing themselves? Um, that would be uh, my topic for the evening if we could have this gathering. And I think all of these figures would have something interesting to say about that. Okay. 
Okay. Perhaps I'll hand that over to to Paul. Um, what do you, what do you make of this room here, Paul? I I, I think Murray throws good parties. <laughs> I think I think I think this is what I would take as a conclusion from that. And um, I, I'm I'm pretty sure Emma Young would have plenty of things to say. Mm-hmm. We'd like to hear from her, wouldn't we, Paul? Uh, we definitely we we definitely definitely would. I, I don't suppose she's got any black books or red books or brown or anything else. She has a diary. She kept a diary that has been kept private. Maybe Sonar has gotten a look at it. Right. Um, and um, Anne Lammers is presently editing her unpublished papers, uh, papers that she gave at the Psychology Club. Uh, so more information about her will be coming out. But there is, uh, I'm told, some private. Uh, material, something like a diary. That would be really interesting, wouldn't it? Yes. One of the, uh, I think, great things about the Black Book, uh, just to get to that topic, is what Sonu says about Tony Wolf, and he had access to her diaries. And that, that's, there's a section in his introduction that um, I found very interesting and informative about um, Tony Wolf's experience um, with Jung, which is, in a sense, Different, almost tragic in some ways, and, and very enriching and beneficial in others. But um, a very mixed story uh, that hasn't really been told. But I think we're starting to get a glimpse of who Tony Wolf was now as well. I mean, this, this bringing in Emma Young's sort of the, the, the diary that you mentioned of that will probably be kept private for quite some time. It seems that one thing, uh, you know, as I mentioned at the start, the, 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 these have only just become accessible and the, the, the task to make the Red Book accessible was itself, a, a, seems to be, from, from my reading, quite an arduous journey, a very difficult journey to uh, make these things publicly accessible. So, I mean, um, Murray, what can, we, what can we say about the, the, the publication of these, these black books uh, in, in, in a practical sense? What, what were the difficulties there? I think for for Jungians. Well, they were uh, <clears throat> they were published ten years after the Red Book was published, um, ten plus, and for a good reason. There, um, I have mixed feelings uh, about the publication of the Black Books, as many people Jungians had about the publication of the Red Book. Jung himself did not publish it in his lifetime. But he did work a lot on it, and he uh, it seems like he had an audience in mind, um, speaking at times to something like an audience in the Red Book. The Black Books are very private. Um, they're the, um, the sort of prima materia, or the, the, um, the raw material out of which he constructed the, uh, the Red Book. Um, and... Um, I think it was a difficult decision to let them be published because they are so private and revealing. Although a lot of the text of the of the, of the black books was already included in Sonu's extraordinary uh, one thousand plus footnotes in uh, in the uh, in his edition of the Red Book, so um, there was quite a lot of material already available from the black books. But there's a lot more, and when you read them, you see what Jung left out. Uh, of the Red Book. Um, I get, uh, uh, um, when I look at the facsimile pages, Jung's handwriting, I start to feel very close to Jung. Uh, You get a a kind of feeling of being in his skin (laughs) or (laughs) looking over his shoulder when you read his handwriting that you don't get from the printed page and the edited uh, copy, uh, the typewritten copy, even the typescripts, uh, that handwriting is so uh, distinctive and so personal that I started feel, uh, feeling closer than I ever have to him. You know, he's a daunting figure, and it takes years and years to begin to um, sort of get uh, inside his thought and his, his um, idiosyncratic uh, interests. Um, and begin to get the whole picture of what you know he's trying to put out there. Um, uh, but you don't really get close to him in the way you do in the Red Book, first of all, but now in the Black Books even more. You are really sitting beside him as he struggles, labors, sweats, <laughs> suffers, 
um, uh, I get a feeling of empathy for him and a feeling of closeness reading this. Um, and um, it's a tremendous work that was done just to um, read these pages. And it's not easy script to read, uh, first of all, and then to translate them um, into English. I s suspect they'll be translated into other languages as well. But that was a, a daunting work uh, that Sono and his colleagues uh, um, uh, did to, to bring this to pass. And, and I'm grateful that they did it, even though I have mixed feelings because there's something a little voyeuristic about it, something maybe we get a little too close to his private inner um, questioning. He's, there's a lot of uncertainty as he writes, and uh, you can see the suffering um, in his um, inner world. Um, I find more dramatic than uh, even the Red Book, which is quite, quite uh, uh, crafted and um, edited by, by himself and, and polished, and the beautiful calligraphic script and everything. This is not calligraphic script. This is raw handwriting in a journal as it pours out of him and as he is confronting himself. Mm -hmm. Paul, I was just wondering if you had anything you want to add. If, uh, you know this 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 idea of um, posthumously publishing almost uh, not so much against wishes, but uh, unknowingly not knowing whether or not this is something to be done. I mean, this is a big debate in, uh, yeah. in yeah. another thinker, I would say, is, is Foucault at the moment, everyone. He said, don't publish anything after my death. And what did they do? They published every single paper they could get their hands on, which you can forgive people for because... So the Kafka said the same thing, but I, they, I, they didn't burn his stories. <laughs> I, was, I, I was just going to say, Murray, I mean, Kafka, Kafka is kind of the classic example of that and, and so on. But of course, you keep on feeling if they really didn't want it published, they, they would have burnt it themselves. Yeah. So, so it's a so it's a difficult one. I, I, I would agree, though, that there is something about this which is um, intensely private um, and intensely personal. And I think that was there with the Red Book as well, um, because all the years that it wasn't published, you had these little teasing references to it uh, here and there, and particularly in memories, dreams, reflections. And one sort of automatic default position, I think, especially coming at it from an academic side, was publish the red book, publish the red book, because you know that's how you saw the logic taking you. And and then as soon as it was there, um, you suddenly thought, oh dear, um, should we have done that? Yeah. Uh, because it is so very very personal. Um, and I think actually then you can work that through and say, well, yes, but it, it does enrich, it does help us understand the, the, the collected works, the published works so much, so much better. Um, it is an enrichment and it's, it, it's not a detraction. Um, and I felt that a little bit the same way with, um, with the black books uh, uh, coming out. Um, on the one hand, that, that raw authenticity that you were talking about, Murray, of, of seeing the handwriting, and, and I agree, it's fascinating, and to, to see the way the handwriting changes and so on. Um, and um, I have to get a little reference into Clarges sooner or later, I suppose, and of course, graphology. Um, you know, this is this is a great moment to do a, a, a graph, graphological analysis if, if you want that kind of thing. Uh, but simply the aesthetic of it, simply looking at it, the, the, swing, the swing of the letters, you know, you don't have to believe graphology to see there's something very important about about looking at the script there. Um, and there's kind of a curious tension between between that very sort of personal side um, and then the appearance of the books in their, their published form, um, uh, which is which is um, um, magnificently done. I mean, it's, it's beautifully published. Um, but when they arrived um, in this box, like this kind of black monolith, um, from Stanley Kubrick film, there was, I did feel some sort of sense of alienation in front of it there, and I think I still do, and I think I'm still working through um, a, a getting used to, to seeing this material, um, but, it, but in a way, it does answer some questions about the Red Book. It, it poses other questions that we haven't thought about before, but, but to my mind, it, it, it really does justify everything that wanted said about um, th this part of Bjorn's life as being um, uh, into, uh, the, the driving force, the Triebkraft behind what was being done um, in, the, in, in the collective works. 
what's surprising perhaps about about the black box is that the mm, the surprises are, are, are different from when the red book appeared and um the decision to bring it out perhaps in the middle of a, of a pandemic i can see was a difficult one because my feeling is that the back the black books haven't had the same kind of reception the same kind generated the same kind of interest because well we've all had our minds on other things um but that's unfortunate and so perhaps we can put that a little bit right today okay and they also don't have the pictures which i think makes the red book uh, so attractive those beautiful paintings um that Jung labored over <clears throat> Uh, and the beautiful script, of course. Um, so the aesthetic uh, features are not in the black books. It's it's raw. It's um, um, it, it, it's a kind of monochrome experience, isn't it? I mean, the, the red book is Technicolor, and, and and this is monochrome, and it's a different kind of aesthetic. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I mean, one one big question to really um, perhaps. Not so much cause a divide, but but look at this the, the the Jungian split which has happened over the years, and perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong. But there there is on the one hand this the the purely psychological aspects of of Jung's thought uh, with the archetypes, with analysis, with the the relation between patient and and analysis uh, analyst, and then on the other on the other side there is the the mystical work, the the religious and yeah mystical work, as I said, the red book and the black books. Now, Murray, I think I'll. I'll put this question to you as someone who is training uh, Jungian analysts and has, has worked in, in th on that side of things for a long time. Um, because these, these books are written 1913 to 1932 and Jung is writing psychological works prior to 19, uh, 1913, do you see these as a sort of bridge between these two uh, Jungian sort of chasms? which often are quite difficult to bridge and people often, it seemed, historically didn't want to uh, assimilate one into the other as a whole package. There was Jung the mystic and Jung the analyst. Um, do you see these as a potential bridge due to the fact they were written over this this long time span and in that we can actually see a bridge between the, the Jungian analysis and the Jungian sort of mysticism? Um <clears throat> I don't know if it's a bridge. Uh, I think what the the Red Book and other Black Books show us is how Jung became a Jungian. Um, the the years up until 1913 were what I call the years of apprenticeship. Uh, he was practicing. He was learning uh, the art and craft of psychiatry at the Berkeley Clinic with with Bleuler, he was learning psychoanalysis with Freud. Uh, he was practicing with his patients. Um, uh, but throughout, he all, always had this uh, religious interest. Um, going back to his college days in the Zofingia uh, um, fraternity, uh, his lectures have been published. And in one of them, he says, religion without mysticism is dead. Mysticism is the yeast or the it's what gives religion its life it's the creative aspect of religion so the topic of mysticism by which he would later say it's really the connection to the depths of the unconscious mysticism is a, a conversation or a, 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 sometimes a union but a, a a linking between the ego consciousness everyday consciousness and the depths of the psyche um, and sometimes in arresting moments of vision and um, big dreams, as he called them, symbolic dreams, sometimes uh, overwhelming, even life-changing experiences, numinous experiences. Um, all of that is a part of Jung from the beginning, from his boyhood on, as I, as I see it. It was more or less um, uh, pushed under the covers while he was in psychiatry and with Freud because psychiatry wasn't interested. Freud was fearful of this uh, flood of occultism that might come flowing into psychoanalysis. Um, Jung wasn't afraid of it, and he wanted to find a way of studying it or including it. So from a scientific position, let's say a, a, a 
an objective uh, uh, scientific observational position. He wanted to study it, but he also wanted to participate in it. And he participated in it in his own way by meditating, doing active imagination, building the tower at Bollingen, um, uh, spending a, a time in conversation with people with uh, deep religious experiences and interests, uh, reading um, um, uh, uh, the um, uh, Rudolf Otto's book on uh, Das Heilige, the experience of the sacred, uh, his uh, dialogues with religious thinkers at Aranos, um, meetings from 1933 on. So in uh, shifting now to this question of the two sides, as far as Jungians are concerned, some Jungians emphasize are more interested, let's say, in the spiritual and religious side or the cultural side, um, and others are much more focused on the clinical, uh, the, the processes that take place within analysis and the transference and the counter-transference and, and um, working with uh, trauma and, and complexes and all of that. So the people who come into training sort of sort themselves and in, in their interests, uh, uh, some more toward the cl clinical side and some more toward the, let's say, spiritual, mystical, religious side. But we try to hold it together and we try to find, uh, we, we, uh, in the theory, it's possible to hold these two dimensions uh, side by side because Jungian analysis is a depth uh, experience of the unconscious. And in that experience, you often have quasi mystical experiences or certainly numinous experiences and dreams. We encourage people to do active imagination, that's part of the clinical work. So it isn't really. Um, uh, so divided, but as you say, uh, people tend to fall in one camp or the other, and there are some sort of more, let's say, secular uh, Jungians and some more spiritual religious Jungians. I tend toward the spiritual religious side myself. My background, I studied theology. Um, I have a degree in the subject, and I came to Jung out of that interest, and because he um, as a psychologist had that interest, so I gravitated toward him rather than to, to Freud, which would have been a, a very different kind of life had I chosen that. <laughs> okay. Paul, Paul, do you do you think that this um, this split is in any sense beneficial, or do you think that there's the, there's perhaps something more going on there as to the reasons well, why there why people split off in these directions? Yeah, um, I, I, I can I can see that there's a kind of you know two sides of the of of the same coin uh, to this uh, to, to this question. Um, I, I suppose one of the problems is that is that the term mystical itself is 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 not a neutral term, um, or, or very often is not used as a as as, as a neutral term, um, uh, but 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 rather as a a, a kind of um, a, a, an attack. Um, so to accuse somebody of, of mysticismus has, um, uh, has has very negative connotations with it. Um, and, and part of the problem then I think is for us today is that we've forgotten just how central that German mystical tradition uh, was within within German thought. Um, I mean, the, the indebtedness of Hegel to Burma is just one example of, of, of numerous ones that you could you could give where you would sh you would be able to show. Um, that what our cut calls mit dem Herzen sehen, so seeing with the heart, absolutely central to to a major strand of of German thought, um, and that tends to be occluded or repressed or ignored in in varying degrees, and that makes then this this question of what is the relation between the between the mystical and the scientific uh, difficult because one of the terms has been unfairly um, weighted, or I, I would say it has been un, un, unfairly weighted or unappreciated. Um, to me. I suppose the the black books do act as a, a a bridge of sorts, in as much as they show the need for um, uh, interpretation. Um, they show that what is going on, at least on one level of the black book and the red books, um, is um, is textual uh, in nature. Uh, and so the question is then: Well, what kind of interpretation uh, is, uh, is is called for? Um, and, and I'm reminded of the way that Jung talks about archaeology as a kind of interpretive science, 
um, uh, which which is is maybe best uh, suited to understand what's happening in the in the black box. Um, so he talks. It's it's in a paper where he's writing about the significance of the unconscious in, in individual education, and and as someone who's kind of involved in education, it's a it, it's a key text, I think. Uh, and he talks about the difference between approaching the unconscious as something which uses scientific methods of calculation and measurement, um, and we're, we're all too familiar with that approach today. And he says there's another one. He says there is an approach which is the approach of the analyst, he says, is like an archaeologist deciphering an unknown script. Um, and I suppose that's what I feel like we have to do, is to bring that kind of archaeological interpretive approach to the black box. I can I can see you trying to uh, not draw in um, Klager's notion of the spirit as you uh, talk about this because it's the exact same thing that he was talking about. But um, one thing one thing you did mention there, which I think as as in this this first session we're talking about almost the the black books as this this uh, almost a, a sacred object on the meta level of what they are, what's going on. Um, perhaps we should mention. Uh, very loosely what exactly is going on in the black books but not in terms of the content which we'll likely focus on in the second session but in terms of Jung's method which Murray has already uh, loosely referred to as this this um, imaginatory experience going back to the imagination that you have in a childhood um, but for Jung this seemed to be something more so perhaps Paul you could mention the the the, the method that you alluded to there that, that Jung is undertaking in writing these these books. Well, uh, I mean, what what I see when when looking um, at, at the red books is is you're embarking on uh, a process of working through, and uh, just as we've heard a lot about um, active imagination as a process which involves um, interacting with the figures of the imagination, or, or or maybe they're not of the imagination. I don't know. Um, but, so he's trying to uh, develop a, a language, a style. Um, he's trying to, to get down on paper um, something which is both visceral and psychological and, and imaginary at the, at, at the same time. Um, at, at several points, um, he foregrounds in particular that what he is working on is, is, is a book. Um, and I think this focus again on on the textual this this isn't a, an attempt to 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 reduce it to just some kind of semiotic game because it, it's plainly much more than that, um, and, and and that's very clear from from the vigor of Jung's of, of Jung's handwriting, but but he does in fact he apostrophizes at one point um, uh, at what he's doing as as oh you book which he is engaged upon as a as a project. Um, so what is he doing? I think it's 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 a search for a, it's a search for a style. It's it's an attempt to translate into into written and textual form. And if he hadn't done that, then we would have no way of being able to understand what he was doing. It has to be cast into linguistic form, other if we or, or pictorial form, sorry, other kind of language, hieroglyphic form, whatever you will. It has to be cast into some form if it is going to be communicable um, to others. And, and for me, one of the moving things he's seeing is how, how Jung is, is working out these different communicative strategies, if you like, um, at, across the pages of the Black Books. Okay. Murray, do you think that's a, that's a problem that one would immediately run into when reading works such as the Red Book or the Black Books is that uh, we'll, in contemporary psychology, one could, if they approach these black books without too much prior knowledge of Jung, they could be mistaken in sort of subsuming all symbols, fantasies and imaginatory experience into one sort of idea that it's all just a, sort of a playful metaphor and that this is a perhaps not a game, but a, almost a novel in a sense, whereas for Jung it's clearly far more. Yes, I, I don't know what the naive uh, reader who didn't know anything about Jung would make of the Red Book or the Black Books. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Jung didn't publish the Red Book in his time, never mind the Black Books, which he would have never published, I'm sure. But he was tempted a bit to publish the Red Book, but he was afraid of how it would be received, how people would read it. Uh, but they wouldn't read it with the proper understanding uh, and seriousness um, that he. Uh, that he intended. And um, I think uh, what he calls active imagination, which is a term that 
gradually evolved um, uh, as he was doing this is um, a very uh, um, serious effort to communicate with the spirits. Um, and, and, and whether he believed uh, in his heart of heart that those spirits exist beyond the psyche or un have an ontological standing of their own, um, I think intuitively he, he, he assumed that. Um, and there are places where the spirits speak back to him. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, Elijah says, uh, you may call us symbols, but we're more real than anything else you know or as real as anything else you know in the material world. And so I think um, Jung had an experience in doing this act of imagination that changed his view uh, of where imagination can take you. I know in his conversations with Henry Corbin later, Henry Corbin was a scholar of Sufism and uh, had the view that uh, imagination is a a cognitive uh, 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 gift that we, uh, human beings have to uh, actually make contact with the spirits, um, and with the angels, and, and uh, with the, the various divinities of that Sufism uh, um, uh, describes. Um, and I don't think Jung was so far far from that. Although I think he held back in his certainly in his official pronouncements. But I think he felt that the imagination can take us uh, to levels of experience that suggest um, uh, a fifth dimension, as it's sometimes called. And that is something beyond our, um, our human uh, limitations and that we can um, gain knowledge, gnosis, wisdom uh, from these kinds of conversations. So um, the person who picks these books up and reads them naively as a, a kind of fanciful, really second-class novel, they don't read very well, I must say. Uh, I read novels a lot. I love good writing. Um, but you, don't, you wouldn't read these for that. Uh, this is not a, you know, an exquisite stylist. This is somebody who's putting out... Um, uh, uh, words on paper that are, um, you know, very uh, um, raw and unformed, and, and he's just trying to get it out. He, it's like, almost like vomiting um, onto the page uh, what he's experiencing. So without uh, care for um, the niceties of, uh, of style, when it gets to the Red Book and is editing these texts uh, for the Red Book, he makes a manuscripts uh, from this raw material, um, it starts to flow a little better, but even the Red Book doesn't read that well, uh, in my opinion. Um, so, uh, but there are different kinds of style. And as Paul says, I think the challenge for Jung was to take what he had experienced and learned um, uh, in these um, Gnostic-like experiences, mystical, if you will, what is mystical after all, if not contact with other spirits and the unknown? Um, what he learned and turning it into a language that he said would be readable and accessible to the people of his of his day, to the spirit of the times. He's going to the spirit of the depths um, in these endeavors, and then he's lifting that and converting it, translating it into the spirit of the times, which is the language of depth psychology. But even there, he struggles and has a hard time when he gets to alchemy. Um, you know, his um, interpretations of the alchemical processes and, and symbols is um, mixed together with um, sort of a tremendous appreciation for what the symbols themselves say to us directly without interpretation. If you can get it, if you, if you can understand the symbolic language, you don't need the interpretation that much. For us, it helps because we don't get it. But um, I think he did. I think he he could understand the uh, after studying them deeply, he could understand the alchemists um, at their level of symbolic um, expression. Okay. Can I just briefly add something on to, uh, to what Murray's been been saying? Then, um, you know, how does Jung himself see it? 
right at the beginning and, and right at the beginning of the first black book or the brown one, I think, as you uh, as you rightly said, James, whatever. He says he says a huge task lay before me. I don't call it Aufgabe. So it's an Aufgabe. It's something which is ihm aufgegeben. It is it is it is a task which he has uh, set set himself or been set. I saw its enormous signs. Its value and meaning escaped me. Um, I got into the dark and I groped along my path. That path led inward and downward. So it starts with this this trepidation um, as to what is to as, as as to what is to come. Um, and I, I find that word Aufgabe very very important in the way that Jung sees it um, as a um, it, it's not a game. There are ludic aspects of it. I think that's certainly true. There are humorous aspects as well. I, I think as well as sometimes the deliberate playfulness. But it's not a game. Uh, or if it's a game, that it's a serious game because it, it's an Aufgabe. It is a task that Jung has been has been set. And his own sense of of uncertainty at the beginning, I think, um, really comes through when you look at the hand tri- at, at the the, the hand trick, when you look at his handwriting uh, there, because he then develops this dialogue style, or he then transcribes, or he then imagines the dialogue which he has with his his soul, which is how it begins. Um, my soul, my soul, where are you? And that, now we're familiar with that from from the Red Book. But, it, but it's interesting. The Red Book has this kind of entrance hall um, of, of of the way of things that are to come. Um, and here it's it's much rawer. It's um, oh my god, I've got this task and I've got to do it, and I don't know how I'm doing it, and I don't even know what it really means. Who gave him the task, Paul? Where did the task come from? Exactly what I was going to ask. <laughs> Who, who get, where do any of us get our task from? I mean, I, I think I think that's one of the beauties of the of, of the word that you can say, you know, mir ist aufgegeben worden. I mean, you can use it in a in, 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 in a passive in a passive sense. And I suppose it is um, if it relates to this idea of this question of you know of what it is that he discovers um, in the in the unconscious. Um, that line when in Black Four he says um, uh, he, he, he talks about um, uh, in, uh, in one's inmost truth is something alive and real. So he's responding; it's a response to what is most alive and real within him. Um, so he gives himself the task, or maybe the self gives him the task. I would say the self gives him the task somehow. I guess we all have that experience, you know, that a task is presented, an Aufgabe, if you go to school, you get an Aufgabe, right, an assignment. You have to produce a paper, that's an Aufgabe. Um, and here's, here the task is um, given, I think, by the self, or you could say something superordinate to the ego. I don't think it was a narcissistic project, in other words. Uh, it was a task given to him that was um, like climbing a mountain. Um, uh, which he um, he loved to climb around in the mountains in Switzerland. So I think that uh, somehow there was this internal demand that he uh, take this path and and explore this territory. That's the Aufgabe. Explore, go into it. You don't know what it is. Um, you don't know if it will produce anything. Are you wasting your time? Um, is this all nonsense? All those questions arose. Um, and yet he he continued he pursued it uh, uh, tenaciously for for nearly twenty years. Uh, it's extraordinary how much time and energy he put into this work. He, he didn't have any emails to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> they are but, 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 <laughs> but, but, but you're no you're absolutely right, Mary. And uh, but but I. Part of the way that he talks about it reminds me as well, and and again, this isn't to re- reduce it um, or to set up false equivalences, but but it's it's um, the sense of a task in the way that Zarathustra has a has a task, um, uh, something which is uh, immensely personal to him, Zarathustra as a, a as a figure that is conceived of as being you know literally world shattering uh, in importance. The doctrine that has to be delivered to uh, uh, to humankind, um, and 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 it, it reminds me the way that he talks about it, not simply the dialogues with the, with the soul and and the kind of internal set of figures, just as you have a set of figures that are uh, that, that appear uh, in thus speaks Zarathustra as well, but this this quailing before 
the task that one has been set or set oneself or been set by the self. Um, and, and, and in many ways, I think um, we this sense of struggle um, is in there right at the beginning and is indeed one of the themes of the Black Books, uh, just as the question of the communicability uh, of what Zarathustra's of Gaba is, is, is one of the important themes in Das Book Zarathustra as well. Well, I have a question for you, and I apologize for this noise outside my window. The neighbor is... That's blowing. okay. I was, I was going to say I'll be able to cut that oh. out. That's, that's fine. Um, I, I, I thought it was an alarm that goes off when one starts talking about the black books. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> um, comparing uh, Jung's oeuvre, uh, the Red Book, to Goethe's Faust. I know, it, it, I mean, it's a bit of a stretch, but Goethe finished his Faust at the end of his life. I mean, um, it was written throughout his life, but a lot of it was written toward the end of his life. In the case of the Red Book, it was written at Jung's midlife, and he tried to pick it up again in his old age, and he put it down. He couldn't do it. Um, should we think of the Red Book and the Black Books as a, a kind of um, youthful or midlife exercise, whereas Goethe's Faust is very mature in, uh, toward the end in, in, in the part two? Is that fair to say? That, that, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I think a right to distinguish the kind of you know chronological place uh, that these respective works um, have have in the lives of their of their authors. Uh, in in the case of Goethe and, and Faust, it as it were in, encapsulates his his activity. So you have uh, you know the or Faust working on Faust one um, uh, when Goethe was young. Then um, he can go to his middle period, and then finally working um, uh, right to the end of his life, almost right to the end of his life, as you, as you say. Um, I think is it finished in 1831, and he dies in 1832. Um, uh, you have the, the conclusions to Faust. Uh, to Faust, it takes him much longer to write Faust two than, than Faust one for for obvious reasons. Um, but again, he talks about it as being his um, Hauptgeschäft, uh, his his main business that's uh, that's there. Suggesting the significance that it uh, uh, that, that he wants to invest it with, um, and so there's both a similarity and a dissimilarity with with, with the Red Book in the case of in, in the case of Jung, um, because it is at one stage his 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 Hauptgeschäft, if you like, um, or lays the foundations um, for his for his Hauptgeschäft um, in terms of in terms of written works, um, and we can maybe come back and talk about the chronology of you know where does this sit. In relation to um, transformations and symbols of libido and psychological types, that might be a question to come back to. But you're absolutely right that it's it's it, it's a midlife work, um, and crucially, unlike Faust II, it, it's an unfinished work. Um, uh, and, and whilst I think there are clearly Faustian elements in there, or rather, that there are elements which both specifically relate to Faust, but also relate more generally to a tradition in which Faust itself needs to be seen, uh, the tragic tradition or the epic tradition, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. But there are very specific echoes um, of of Homer, um, Goethe, Nietzsche, as we've been uh, as we've been talking about. But but Comitum is this idea of of a transformatory journey that the uh, the protagonist is is going through. Um, and we know from the comments that Jung makes in Memory, Dreams, and Reflections else, elsewhere about how he sees this in affinity with uh, with Goethe. Um, and I think we can see how he uses uh, this idea of transformation in, in, in the black box is that he is embarked on some process of um, rejuvenation. Now, that happens much more easily in, um, in Goethe's Faust because you just sign a pact with Mephisto and bang, you're rejuvenated and it's all sorted out. Except then you have the, the whole of the rest of, um, uh, of of part part two to kind of atone for the consequences of that that happen in in, in part one. Um, the transformation is much longer and much more and, and much more drawn drawn out. And I suppose I see the difference there on 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 the level of narrative of being that Goethe's Faust is about the consequences of transformation. The black books, the red book, about actually the journey of transformation that that one goes through, the journey of transformation that the God, as it's described. Uh, uh, goes through, but again, on terms of in terms of the textual level, Goethe is specifically trying out various forms of writing in Faust in Faust two, the different metrical forms, 
the different cultural settings, um, contemporary, medieval, um, ancient Greece, um, and then whatever we end up with um, in the final act as we as we float off up to uh, up up to heaven. Um, I suppose a kind of Dantesque parody of what it would mean to be uh, to be assumed into the in, into the eternal. Um, so. Again, I would make this point about the experience of writing and, and trying to communicate as being essential in many ways to both of them. That's not to reduce them to, to that as, a, as an exercise, but it is explicitly thematized in various uh, in various ways. And it's obviously there in Gerda Faust Pass too because of its, its metrical richness and its uh, the richness of its historical references. I think um, Goethe was really, really conceived of himself as a as an artist and a writer. I don't think Jung, I don't think it was quite as primary in Jung. Jung was a writer, he wrote a lot, but I, I think it, it had a, a lesser, let's say, priority uh, uh, in his, say, his value system. I think he, he put, a, he would have put a great emphasis on um, realizing the um, insights that one gets through writing, through through the act of writing the Red Book, I think he had experiences that he then needed to live and live out and incarnate. So to bring out the homunculus that he creates through this alchemical process in himself and then incarnate it and bring it into life. Uh, I don't know that Goethe was so inclined in that direction, whether writing was an end in itself, or the beauty of it. Um, whereas for Jung, I don't think it was an end in itself. I think living was an end in itself. I, I, I think, I think that's, that, that's, that's fair comment. Um, uh, with the, I mean, okay, let's put it this way, you know, they have, you know, Goethe's there as the, uh, as the Hofrat, um, so he has a political function to do. Jung has has a, 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 an analyst's uh, task to a task to do. Um, but I would see this question about about communication and and, and the social style as central to as, as central to, to both of them. And and actually on, on, on the question of living, um, in one of his letters, Goethe has this marvelous line where he says, "The point of life is life." Um, and that strikes me as a very Jungian kind of sentiment yes, as, so. as, as well. Um, maybe we won't look at it the other way around and say that, that Jung is in some sense conflicted um, ab about his writing or about his painting or, or, or about that, um, th that aspect of his, of his activity in a, way that, uh, in a way that Goethe isn't. Um, but, but trying to be Goethe was, was hard enough for Goethe himself. Certainly nobody else was ever going to be able to do that. One thing that struck me when I read the Red Book the first time, and now looking, I uh, haven't read the Black Books thoroughly, I, I have to say, uh, I mean, I, 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 I read around in them. But one thing that struck me was the, um, the element of the Christian and Jung that, I mean, Gantu really rejected uh, Christian religion, didn't care at all for it. Um, with Jung, you get a very different... Uh, feeling about Christianity, not that he identified himself so much as a Christian, but there's a lot of Christian talk, a, a lot of references, and um, you sort of get the, the feeling of someone who's really grown up in the Christian um, system uh, of belief, and while he stands apart from it, it's in him much more mm -hmm. than quite maybe you find in somebody mm -hmm. like Goethe or Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I, th I, th I think that's absolutely right. that. Um, Goethe says somewhere where he's he's um, very critical about uh, about Christians and, uh, and 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 their attacks on him for being immoral and so on. Uh, and he says, look, you know, um, I, I, I even got Gretchen executed. Aren't the Christians grateful to me for having done having done that? Um, and, and so so I I think you're right that he's um, uh, much uh, he's come to term if we if you like with 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 the collapse of Christianity in in a way that Jung finds much more difficult. That Jung misses it. Um, so yeah. much, so much more, um, and yet again, common to both. So it's maybe a question of, of accent, different accentuation and, and expression. Um, is this is this question of well, what do we do with this huge symbolic heritage that we that we have? So we we have all these centres of, of Christianity, um, and they've shaped us into what we are, and, and, and we have this symbolic uh, inheritance around us, um, and yet it doesn't seem to be working anymore. Um, 
And 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 Goethe's response, I think, is well, what you can do and it is play with it, um, and and you can you can use it, um, appropriate it um, uh, for aesthetic purposes in in the way that he does uh, in in Faust. Um, very clearly at, at the end, this this idea of floating up to the Martin Gloriosa uh, is taken from Dante. Um, and, and yet interesting in the Black Books as well, at, at a couple of crucial moments, there are passages quote, very explicitly quoted from, uh, quoted from Dante. Um, and so I suppose I would see Jung is asking this question as well, but he's, but he's asking this um, a century a bit on when it's become so much more urgent. Um, and you can say, well, if the symbolic system is disappearing in, in Goethe's time, by the time it reaches Jung, it, it's absolutely crashed. Um, and, and it's therefore much more urgent. What do we do when the symbols are there, but we don't understand them anymore? How do we how do we reinvigorate them? Or, as he formulated in Transformations and Symbols of the Libido, how do we replace belief with understanding um, and thereby preserve the beauty of the symbol? And, and I suppose that's how I would see it. Jung's uh, uh, Definition of his of his own of his task his Aufgabe, um in in a more theoretical sense. I mean that, that's an interesting question. I think it's in it's in the introduction for volume one that uh, Sonny mentions the that Jung had this set of is it thirty four volumes of the of mystical text. You know he was well read. I mean that's an understatement in the mystical tradition, the ancient ancient wisdom traditions as they're known. And yet, as you emphasize, Murray, it, uh, the, the Christian always seems to come through. Do you think there is a, there's a, there's a reason or, or, or uh, some perhaps a bi- biographical reason as to why it seems that the Christian or the Christian tradition and the Christian symbology always, it sounds a bit cheap, but comes out on top for you? Um. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> I think he was um, deeply embedded in Christian culture. You know, he came from Basel. Um, um, his father was a, um, a Protestant Reformed pastor. His grandfather was a big, you know, figure in the Protestant Church. Six of his uncles were Protestant pastors, so it was all around him in his personal life history. Um, and um, I think it got into his blood. Um, uh, I think it's in his soul somehow. I think it's embedded in his soul, the Christian um, myth, if you will. There is a scene in the Red Book uh, in, uh, where he uh, actually identifies with Christ on the cross and, um, um, and sort of shudders in horror at the, uh, at the experience in one way, but on the other hand, uh, I think he was, um, if ambivalent, he was still very um, connected to the symbolic values and meanings of uh, of Christian uh, religion. Um, and as Paul says, this uh, this question of what to do with this um, huge heritage uh, that we have. Um, uh, Jung would often say he's writing for people who have fallen out of the tradition, not for the believers who can stay in it, but for those who can no longer participate uh, authentically or with a good conscience um, on a deeper than personal level uh, in um, religious rituals and activities. Uh, So uh, in a sense, he was trying to um, uh, provide uh, access to a a spiritual life, not in contradiction to the Christian past, but perhaps um, um, in in relation to it somehow. Uh, I think he was struggling for how to relate to the uh, Christian past. In a sense, he felt it was over. Age of Pisces would be more or less the end of the Christian era. A new religion would develop in 600 years, he said in one, uh, one letter. Um, a new world religion, and he was um, participating in that creation. He did call his red book Liber Novus, um, which to my ear sounds quite a bit like New Testament, uh, the new book. Um, and I think uh, for him, uh, this um, these experiences um, and the dreams that he weaves into the active imagination experiences and his interpretations of them 
were a kind of sacred text for him. I don't think he meant the Red Book to become a Bible for other people. That's why he didn't publish it. But for him, I think it was a sacred text um, that he could refer back to, think back on, occasionally open and look at again and refresh himself. Um, the, the birth of the new god, Phanes, who comes into being, um, and his attempt to, to live the message that he got from Philemon in his life, uh, I think was his expression of kind of variation on, on uh, the Christian life, in a sense. Does I can just come oh, sorry, in, just come in there briefly on, on, on that, because um, picking up on this idea of Liber Novus and, and so on is uh, a quotation that came to me when you were, were speaking, Murray, uh, from, a, from a paper that Jung Gil gives to the uh, Guild of Pastoral Psychology in London in, in 1939. Um, and, um, and, and to me, I think it helps situate what, what, what Jung's doing in the Black Books and, and elsewhere very well. Where, where Jung says this, he says, what I've spoken of, spoken of is, alas, to a great extent, the past. We, we cannot turn the wheel backwards. We cannot go back to the symbolism that is gone. No sooner do you know that this thing is symbolic than you say, oh, well, it presumably means something else. Doubt has killed it, has devoured it. So you cannot go back. I cannot go to the Catholic Church. I cannot experience the miracle of Mass. I know too much about it. I know it's the truth, but it's the truth in a form which I cannot accept anymore. I can't say this is the sacrifice of Christ and see him anymore. I can't. It's no longer true to me. It does not express my psychological condition. My psychological condition wants something else. I must have a situation in which that thing becomes true once more. I need a new form. And, and, and to me, I think that gives a great sense of what Jung is trying to do, this struggle for a new form whether one emphasizes the novelty or the formal aspect of it, they both belong together. I agree with you, Paul. Uh, in one letter to Victor White, who couldn't let go of the old form, <clears throat> he said, new wine needs new bottles, needs new containers. So I think it was, um, he wasn't rejecting the past. He was deeply connected to the past. He appreciated the past. Uh, he could resonate with it. He had religious musicality in his blood, uh, but he couldn't believe it. He couldn't uh, participate fully in it. So he needed a new form. And that was what he went for and discovered in the use of active imagination, working with dreams and so on, and provided that with it to his patients. They all did active imagination. They all worked on their dreams. This was the way, this is the new way. Um, I'm going to have to stop, James. Okay. Um, Just stop here and then go through to the second session whenever we organise it. So, yeah, Murray Stein and Paul Bishop, uh, thanks very much for coming on and I look forward to the next session. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you.